Okay, welcome back to track one. It brings me immense pleasure to welcome our, one of the set of our oldest alumni, um, <clears throat> Ken Owens from MasterCard. Uh, Ken did us the immeasurable favor back in the day of not only flying all the way from the States to talk at the original Software Circus in uh, Amsterdam, but also you know, just flying all the way from the States to go to a software that was arguably organized by what were then a bunch of amateurs on a very short timeline. So Ken, welcome back and thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be be back and be part of, uh, of the Software Circus reunion. It, uh, it was a great time then. I'm sure it's gonna be even a better time today. So um, good afternoon, um, good morning and good evening to everyone watching this. Um, hopefully you're staying healthy and, and um, well in your self-isolations. Um, I'm here to talk about curiosity that does not necessarily have to kill the cat. And I have my uh, my co-host over here with me, my two white white rabbits that um, are going to kind of keep me on the straight and narrow path today down the rabbit hole to um, to Wonderland. And so um, you can find me at um, at Ken Owens Twelve on on Git and um, Twitter and LinkedIn. So I can make it kind of easy. Um, who I am is a um, you know a technical executive. I have um, too much experience been um, getting older and older every day and feeling it. Um, I've been mostly in the financial services and cloud services industries, but I started my career in uh, communication systems. Um, spent a lot of, um, of my day thinking about innovation and transformation and not just um, of large organizations, um, but also you know personal transformation, how to continue to grow and continue to innovate and, and change how I look at, at problems and solutions. Um, I feel like I'm a technologist at heart. Um, I do have an electrical engineering degree. Um, I've worked most of my career in complex distributed systems and embedded systems design. And I have spent um, a good part of my career as a developer as well. Um, and then personally, I'm a husband, a father. I love to um, be involved in my community and I love sports and the outdoors. And so, you know, I kind of thought of, you know, even though this is a cat and not a rabbit, I, the way, um, you know, Alice went down into the, the rabbit hole following the white rabbit was based on her curiosity of, you know, who is, why is this rabbit wearing a, you know, a top cat, top hat and a coat and, you know, um, has a watch and worried about the time, right? And so um, I think in today's, um, you know, post-COVID world we're going to be in, right, the curiosity can really be a a killer of innovation and of trying to do things um, differently and better and to innovate. And I think as you know, in my personal experience with platform engineers and architects, they are very, um, by nature, they're very concerned about change and how to, you know, innovate and drive forward organizations and organizations and look at some of the cloud native patterns that are coming out and it, they're not quite sure how to, you know, process them and, and figure them out. And so today I'm gonna to talk a lot about my experience with how to do that. And so curiosity can be a good thing in, in my experience. Um, there's sort of four things that I want to discuss today. Um, the first one is sort of the investigation of, of how, why investigation can be a good thing and how to do it right. Um, experimentation, which is the fun part of what we do, right? Everyone loves the experimentation part. Um, and then the part that we, we should do better on that we don't do as well on usually is the retrospectives and understanding what things worked well and what things we need to stop doing. And then, you know, lastly, iterate and deliver is, is sort of the, my key mantra, right? Keep, keep iterating and keep delivering. Um, and so, you know, kind of a personal, you know, um, experience on curiosity, right? My, most of my career, I've always liked to ask the, the why and the how. And so curiosity and how things work has sort of been, been my, uh, my mantra for my whole career, uh, probably because I like to break things, as my wife would tell you. So I, I need to be busy so I don't you know, get too curious about how things work, because then I go and try to figure out how they work, and I usually end up breaking them. And most of the time, I fix them, but there are probably cases where I haven't fixed them. And so um, I think that's a good... Um, aspect of, of an engineer's mantra, right, is to understand how things work, try to get into the details, and not just, um, you know, within a lot of organizations, you have these silos, right, so you have to not know just how things work within that, that silo you're in, but you need to kind of understand the product that you're delivering or the service you're delivering, 
and think about things at a much broader level. How do I, why, how does this solution get delivered to a customer? What's the experience that customer has? You, you hear me talk a lot about that experience over the next half hour. And then um, curiosity in the why, like why are we doing things this way? Um, why is it, why did this, you know, need to be processed, need to be created in the beginning? Um, those are types of questions I like to ask a lot because um, a lot of times we get so caught up in the, this is the way we've always done things, right? And and uh, this is, you know, I can't, I don't understand why we would want to change this, it works fine, right? And so not, not necessarily trying to change things or trying to break um, the processes, but trying to understand why we have them in the first place is a, is a very, I think, important curiosity to have. So kind of thinking about investigation, um, I look at, you know, this sort of cloud native definition um, from the CNCF. And, um, you know, a lot of it is about, you know, how we build and run scalable applications in a modern dynamic environment. And so when you look at this, um, that first paragraph, there's a lot of, you know, day-to-day -day work that we have to do, right? The building and running of applications is a, is a minute by minute activity, right? Um, the environments that we run them in can be very different. And, and that's where a lot of the complexity, I think, comes in. A lot of the, um, the lack of innovation in enterprises happens. Um, the other piece of this is in that, that second paragraph, it talks about, um, you know, make high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimal toll. And I would say that, you know, that's, that's a goal that most organizations have today. And it's very difficult to achieve because minimal toll um, in a world with a lot of process and compliance and regulatory concerns is not an easy statement to make, right? It, there's a lot of, of change controls and a lot of processes in place that are there for a good reason. Um, but again, there, there might be better ways to, to ensure that you're doing these changes frequently and predictably with minimal toll without having humans to be that, that toll and gate, right? Um, so that's sort of, you know, thinking about the definition of, you know, what we're trying to do in this cloud native world. Um, I think it's kind of a simple how, right? The, the how we do this, I think starts out very simply, right? You just start asking um, questions and assessing your current situation, right? What, what am I trying to deliver today? How am I delivering that today? Um, ask some of the you know, understanding of the end user, right? Talk with your customers and see how are they, um, you know, how do they perceive the experience? Start working with your engineers to understand the, you know, steps they take, the processes they're following, and why they think they're doing what they're doing, right? So it always kind of starts with baselining or understanding where you're at. And then the next part is where I think, you know, in Wonderland, you have to really think and use your imagination and try to understand what's possible, right? And not just what would be, you know, a good, you know, iterative first step, but actually what's the end state I'm trying to accomplish, right? Think about where, where do I want to go to? What do I want to accomplish? And really think about the possibility, not just the, what, what I could do within the constraints that I have today, but what could I do if I didn't have these constraints? If I had, a, you know, my own, if I was the CEO today, what would I do to make this better? And that's, I think, a very important um, step to take. In this first in this first investigation process, right, and then then the practicality has to sit in, right. You need to develop use cases that are going to address that that current situation. Um, that you know you have gaps and you have um, you know real business need to address today, but also with the direction of where you want to get to, right. So you should be looking at the use cases needed to kind of move from the current situation to the future situation. And this should be something that you're doing on, a, on an iterative continuous basis, right? It's not just, um, you don't do this on, you know, June 1st, 2020, and then you're done. We have to do this, you know, every, every iteration, every um, planning time that you have for, for how you want to evolve the backlog and groom the backlog. You should be looking at how close am I today to my, my future state? knowing that as you're doing this, your future state should also be changing as, as technology improves and new technologies come out, that future state will continuously be evolving to a next future state. And so it, it's complicated because you could always feel like you're never accomplishing anything, but you are, you're moving down a path to get to a better state. 
um, but that end state is probably not going to ever be a done state. And so you have to think about that as you're, as you're going through this simple process. And then execute. Um, I can't, um, you know, really convey just how important execution is in today's in economy that um, a lot of good ideas, a lot of um, great documentation around what could be done or what should be done, but the ability to take what is a good idea and then execute against that idea and deliver it is, is the key of this whole process. So you have to be able to deliver um, against that, that vision and start showing progress towards that end state. And then, you know, a good example of, of just how complicated this gets is this um, is a CNCF landscape. And so I'll just kind of flash this up here. Um, and so as you're you know, doing this investigation, right, and you're kind of looking at the gaps and, and trying to look at where you can find solutions to the gaps. Um, I personally use the CNCF landscape a lot to kind of look at what solutions exist in a certain area that I'm trying to solve a problem in. And most of the time, you know, in, in my um, last, you know, couple of, of career jobs, I've had to look at these different areas and, and pretty much all of them, right? So this is maybe a new area that I haven't had to look in as much, but um, I can think of, you know, database problems I was trying to solve, streaming and messaging problems, you know, proxy is a newer technology, but we have, you know, a lot of edge um, components that we work on. And so looking at, you know, proxies and gateways and service mesh have been sort of newer problems that I've been looking at, but pretty much every you know, category and subcategory on this landscape I've had to look at and investigate. But as you look at this, you can see it's just overwhelming, right? There's so many choices, so many different things to look at. And so understanding the the why and the how is so important in, in kind of going into this landscape with a certain lens. So you can filter in on exactly what is the area you want to look at and then what's the type of solution you want to look for. And so then, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the next step is to really develop that definition of done. Because um, you're not going to ever really be done, as I mentioned. And so you don't want to have a target date where you're going to have, you know, you have five or six use cases, you know, that have been elaborated to 40 stories defined and, and done. You may finish those 40 stories, but you're going to continue to add to those stories as you kind of evolve and, and understand and learn from how you're doing the innovation. And so um, the first piece of, I think, the definition of a done solution is a deterrent pattern. It's a pattern that has um, one methodology, one approach, one solution, and there's no um, human interaction or human involvement to try to, um, to fix it or break it, right? It, it, it can only work a certain way. Um, there's only this amount of choice provided in that pattern and not infinite choice and infinite possibility. And so moving to more of a declared state of, of what you desire to be in is sort of the direction you want to head with that definition. Um, always, you know, look at an API first methodology. Um, that's been true for, for many years now, but it's you'd be surprised at the lack of, of APIs um, being looked at and developed and supported. And just the breadth of, you know, the companies that do support APIs, they're so different in, in how they've been defined and how they interact. Um, I personally always look at day two operations. I think um, anything that you build has to be built to run. And so as you look at day two operations, you have your drift detection, monitoring of, of what you're deploying. Um, how do you log and make sure that you're, you're getting the right events and you know what those, that those events matter and when those events matter? And then how do you decom? Um, I, so it's so odd that in, in most of my career, it's the, the creating is the easy part. It's always the modifications and the decoms that, that complicate the problem because you're, you're changing systems and their states and, and their dependencies between, between systems. It's a lot easier to just create something than it is to modify it. And so, you know, go into the definition of done with, you know, how am I going to create? How am I going to modify? How am I going to delete these, these solutions? Um, Another piece that I think gets overlooked a lot is service assurance. And so um, there is a, you know, expectation. Um, I think SLA and SLOs are, are kind of words that a lot of people don't like to use anymore, but there really is a, a, an expectation that you would deliver a service with certain, you know, availability, certain reliability. Um, and you should, you know, build that into that definition of done because it's not going to be perfect. And so going into this knowing it's not going to be perfect. And when you're in Wonderland, there are there are obstacles, and there are going to be 
um, things you don't expect. And so make sure that you, you think about what are some of those areas that you want to be able to say, here's my goal for how I'm gonna say I'm done with this service assurance. And then even if you don't need high availability or you think that security isn't as critical for your, your solution today, or maybe even you're not globally deployable, right? Or you're not worried about global solutions. Don't, you know, don't let the, where you're at today stop you from designing the right solution. Because if you design a highly available, secure, globally distributed solution, and you only deploy it in one location, you haven't hurt anything, right? You haven't broken anything. But if you don't design it for that and you eventually need high availability, it's very difficult to add in high availability after the fact. It's very difficult to make something secure after the fact. Um, you can bolt things around it, but the core will still be insecure, which is really where the, the problems and, and things happen. So always build for high availability and security and for global distribution. Um, always trade off the you know complexity of of some of those decisions for the you know today what I need, but always have in mind and design for the end state that you will hopefully get to one day. Um, from a user experience standpoint, um, I always think it's important to talk with your users, um, which again is not um, as obvious to a lot of um, companies I've worked in that the users. Um, do know um, and can give you a lot of information about how your experience is and, and what they would like to see to improve it. Um, be, be very considerate, I guess, of um, and consider what you want um, your experience to look like. And um, you know, you don't have to always do what your users ask you to do, but it's probably a good idea to listen and understand what they're looking for. Um, I think it's important to kind of obsess over each aspect of that experience from, you know, how they um, will learn about your, your solution, um, how your customer or user will interact and wants to interact with your solution, how they're going to use it to enable their business. Um, you know, any piece of that, that customer journey is important to try to understand and not just the technical aspects of it, but the user and the human, you know, aspects of it as well. And then measure carefully. I know measurements are, um, are difficult at a lot of things. Um, and some, in the case of where they're easy, that's that's great. But most of the time, having a baseline and we're going to collect data and manage and understand, um, you know, the um, the customer experience and the you know the the promoter scores and some of these other aspects that are out there for for managing user expe expectations is is difficult at times. But it's important to select those measurements carefully and look at both the leading and the the lagging sort of metrics to understand, you know, if you're heading in the right direction and if the experience is, is meeting the expectations of your end users. And so then, you know, the next piece of this is that um, when I look at, you know, my own experience, there are a lot of challenges that I think, um, you know, come to bear in this type of a discussion. And so the first one is, you know, scripting versus, you know, exposing infrastructure as a service. And so um, a lot of, you um, enterprises have tricked themselves into believing that, you know, they can, you know, have a shell script or a bash script and just call that from another, you know, system and that's automation and that's infrastructure as, as code or infrastructure as a service. And it's, it's definitely not. And so think of, you know, ways that you can sort of ensure that scripts are not part of, of a solution, right? They, they may be necessary for some things, but for the most part, you want to have a, a role defined set of code that's going to manage and support um, your needs over time. Um, st uh, state of storage and the state of systems is always a complicated um, challenge. Um, understanding, you know, where, where that state is and if it's healthy, um, if it's degraded, sort of understanding those, those aspects are very important. Um, like I mentioned already, the data operations piece is important. And then, you know, lastly, you know, I think looking at the API integrations um, and how you, ex, you know, interact with external solutions and systems um, are things that probably need to be written um, as one of the first, um, you know, goals of, a, of an experience. So what I like to kind of do when I'm going through this exercise is understand the boundaries, right? And so I kind of start off with what do, you know, what do we do as an organization, right? And so in in my ex experience right now, I'm kind of involved in a lot of software development lifecycle, a lot of automation, 
um, operating a platform and then, you know, looking at, you know, how we interact with dependent services and the business services. And then there's the, you know, why we do it, right? And so we, we don't, you know, do things just for the sake of doing them, right? So there's, we're trying to provide customer value, ensure that the code has, has high quality. We're trying to make sure we have resilience and availability and there's financial and, you know, compliance reasons why we will have like different dependent services and business services in place. And so understanding, you know, what you do and why you do it is very important. And you know, it can be as simple as just kind of laying them out like this, or it can be as complicated as, as you can make it. And so the important part is just understanding what those boundaries are and uh, understanding the why behind the what. So once you've sort of, you know, done your investigation, the next piece is then experimentation. And so as you get into experimentation, it's really important to kind of start with the end in mind. And so I like to always have a conceptual design, uh, put some wireframes together. Um, wireframes are pretty quick and easy and most, um, you know, developers can, can do them pretty quickly. Um, you don't have to be a, a UX designer, UX expert in the beginning phases. And then, you know, a simple prototype out of that wireframe is important. Um, both of these, these steps, I like to work with my end users. And so I kind of build a small end user advisory board and work with them to kind of show them the concepts, get their buy-in, get their feedback, um, create the wireframes, get their buy-in and feedback, um, and then create a working prototype and have them interact with an actual system that is in a sandbox, but is still an actual system that's provisioning and, and doing the the work that we're trying to address, um, a need that the business has. And then um, that interaction and those user experience trials are, are really important to, um, to think about how you do them, the, the steps you wanna take, um, the messaging and the communications you wanna be able to have with your end users um, to ensure that you're not you know, giving them too much information or too much overload of data, but also not, um, you know, not meeting the needs that, the, that they're saying they have in, in a way that makes sense to your business and to your product. And then um, release, right? Once you kind of get through the, the um, prototype and you go through the experience trials and you have a product that you know is, is needed and the enhancement or a, a solution service that's been developed, you release that um, and you kind of do your release management around that. And then you sort of go back and continue planning, right? You're continuously evolving, right? So you think of what's next, you do another conceptual design. So this is sort of like a loop that you just continue going through um, for each um, iteration and each design concept that you want to address. Um, like I said, that's kind of the fun part. Um, the part that I think is not as fun is the retrospectives, um, not because we don't like them, but more because we don't actually know how to use them, I don't believe, right? And I think this is sort of an industry challenge that engineering has lost that discipline of self-awareness. And I call it self-awareness because you have to really understand how well um, your solution is working, not not your perception of how well it works and not the, the amount of revenue that it's generating, but really understand how well this solution is meeting the needs of, of your end users. And so when you kind of compare your desired solution to the actual solution, you want to be very honest with how well and how close you are to the solution that you, you know you want to have, right? And, and all of us as engineers have that inside us. We know when a solution is a great solution or when it needs some additional work, right? And so if you're, if you're honest with yourself, you know that, that answer without anyone telling you and you know what you should do next. Um, I like to review um, in, in most of our retrospectives, I kind of review the case study that I did at the very beginning of the journey to make sure that we're understanding our customers and understanding that we're, what we're addressing and why. Um, and then the, you know, looking at the customer journey that we went through with the customers and then those interactions and showing that we're not you know, just delivering a technical solution that hasn't met the user's needs, that, but we're delivering a complete solution that does meet, you know, not only our technical needs, but also the user experience we're trying to provide. And then, you know, when you talk about what went well and what could be improved and what needs to stop, those those are sort of um, you know steps of the of the retrospective meeting that we go through very quickly, right? And we capture notes and we post those notes, but I don't think we really internalize what went well and what we, could be improved and what needs to stop. And so, 
um, I think it's important to you know apply those those learnings and the desired state we're trying to get to to the next iteration immediately. Don't wait um, for you know someone else to come in and tell you that you should do that. I would say you know as engineers we need to take that by the horns and say let's do this and let's put it into the next iteration. And then iterate and deliver, right? Um, repeat and enforce the well. And so I think we don't do a great job of celebrating the small victories. We There's a lot of, um, in engineering especially, we can always do better. We always know um, that things are not perfect. And so it, it's very easy to get stuck in the cycle of it's not done and it, it needs more work. And I think it's very important that we celebrate those small victories. We celebrate what we did well, um, that we enjoy and we acknowledge that we did this well, right? And that it's, it's a good, a good solution, a good design, a good practice we put in place, right? And then we want to embed that into our culture and into the fabric of who we are as a group and as an organization. And then stop the stop, like really stop it. Um, there's, there's so many times I see and, and hear from some of my development teams that, you know, we, we did this, you know, we've talked about stopping this for the last four iterations. Um, and that's really something that I, I've tried to like, enforce that we do actually stop the things that we say we need to stop doing because it doesn't help the organization, it doesn't help the, the team, it doesn't help the delivery of what we're trying to deliver. And so I guess, you know, the conclusion for, for talk is, you know, that QIC does not kill the cat, um, that, you know, if you investigate um, the solutions you're trying to look at, you do some experimentation, um, you repeat and enforce the well and you stop the stop, you're going to enjoy the cloud native wonderland. So thank you very much for, um, for your time and attention. And I'll turn it back over to Mark. All right. Thank you very much, Ken. I really appreciate that. And uh, the, the chat has been blowing up with appreciation for you bringing live rabbits to the situation. Uh, <laughs> I think that I think that has set a new precedent. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. And, and obviously, I've had the benefit of seeing your talk uh, in 2015, where it, it wasn't the same thing, but there were similar themes. It was about how to approach problems. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk to how, like what you've learned in those five years and like, but you know, how, how, how your approach to that has changed. I think in, in the last five years, Mark, it's been a lot of, of practical use of those, those um, ideas and those concepts and, and realizing where the benefits are and, and going through this approach. And so um, my experience has been very um, positive, I would say, in most cases. I've, I've learned a few things around, you know, you have to not ignore the people, right? Probably the biggest lesson I've learned is um, technology comes easy to us. I used to always start with, you know, the technical needs and the technical solution. Um, but as of, you know, recently, I feel like it's not just the technical solution that is, is, is important, right? It's, it's easy in, in many ways to do the technical solution. Um, what's hard is the people um, that are involved in your organization, they want to um, come along for the journey, right? They, there's a lot of resistance, obviously, um, as you'd expect, um, change is hard. But if you go into this with the mindset of, you know, change is hard, but the, the people do a great job. They know their job well, right? Um, in most companies I've been in, they're experts in their field, right? It's, it's undoubtedly, they are the, the experts. And, and I'm coming in telling them they need to do things differently and I'm, I'm not an expert in their field, right? And so they look at me like, okay, sure. Um, you've been doing this for how long? Like you've been here six months? Yeah, I'm, I've been here 20 years. Why would I do something different just because you want me to? And I think it's, it's a, this mindset of, you know, let's work together, let's involve and, and, and iterate together towards this journey and help have them become part of the solution versus the problem. Um, then they, they get a lot more involved. And so that's been my biggest lesson I've learned, Mike, is just to sort of include, include your experts in the journey, let them help you go through the journey. And it, it takes longer, honestly, it, it does. You know, it's not, I wish it could be, you know, a snap of the fingers and, you know, you're in, you're in the wonderland, but it, it does take, you know, months to get individuals to think differently, but it really does have to, it's the old mantra, it has to become their idea, right? It, it has to be their idea that to do this, even though you planted the seeds and you've helped grow and fertilize the seed, right? It's, it has to end up being their idea because they own it, right? In the end of the day, I have to tell people when, when something breaks, 
they're going to fix it, right? I'm, they're not going to call me and say, hey, Ken, come fix this. They're going to call the expert to say, hey, this is broken. What's going on? And and in most cases, especially in, you know, in, in my current role, you know, time is money. And so we have to make sure that if, if, nothing, if anything does fail, which hopefully it won't knock it on, knock it on wood right now, um, then, you know, we have, we do have the experts that know how to keep things up and running and not break it. So. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Ken. I mean, I can't um, express my appreciation for not only taking a chance on us five years ago, but also coming back again and bringing live rabbits with you. Thank you so much. I feel like yep. this, this works. They're, they're very happy to be here too. They're, um, this one I think is Emu. So Emu says hi. Hi to everyone. Hi, Emu. Uh, Emo's making friends in the chat right now. Um, so Ken will stick around later. If you want to talk to Ken, you can find him through the Brella app. Also, um, I'd like to encourage you to go and see our sponsors in the sponsor app. Um, some people have started, uh, and I want to apologize. A lot of people have been using this now and trying to set up meetings with me today. I can't do meetings today. I'm hosting a conference. But if you <laughs> get in touch with me, I will figure out a time to talk to you another time. Um, let's have some canned applause for Ken. There we go. Great. All right. Thank you, Ken. We're now going over to the uh, lightning talk uh, round. Um, I'll see you over there in a moment. Thanks again. Bye-bye.